today uh, we have a, a very special person and very special uh, topic uh, to, to cover. Uh, but before we go into that, just a quick overview uh, about Constantin, uh, No Limit Hub, the nonprofit NGO that's, that's behind and organizing um, uh, Constantin meetups and conferences. Um, it started off as uh, one of the biggest um, local uh, IT um, events, so con physical conferences in Serbia, in Niš, a city in the south of Serbia. But then uh, since COVID hit, we decided to expand and uh, offer uh, all these knowledge and great speakers that we acquire and get uh, get to share their knowledge with our local community to, to share it even wider um, and globally. So um, that's why we decided to do Constantin meetups. So it's basically just one talk per day. Uh, we're doing it every week uh, for the next uh, 10 weeks. Uh, if you already haven't, or if you're viewing this video on some other platform, go to Constantin. So uh, codestuntteam.com. Uh, I hope we'll add this in the final edits uh, after so you can kind of see uh, how it's spelled as well. But there's 10 awesome speakers already uh, lined up for you um, in the following weeks. Uh, so one talk per week. Um, don't miss out and go there uh, and sign up for a free account to get notified for and register for all the future talks. It's completely free. Um, uh, so go ahead and do that uh, to register for the upcoming events as well. Today, um, we will be talking uh, uh, and we'll be having kind of first part of the lecture will be uh, theoretical, uh, getting to know Neo4j uh, um, as kind of um, one of the leaders for, for graph databases. And we'll talk about graph databases and um, how and, and can do with them when you should use um, um, graph databases and like how to identify which problems are fit for this. Um, and uh, also we'll do a hands-on um, dive in and like just try to play around uh, with a little bit so that everybody uh, who are on this session and workshop and meetup, however you want to call it, uh, get a feel uh, for neo for j uh, and um, I want to thank uh, Ljubica Lazarevic, who is a developer advocate uh, at Neo4j, uh, for, for being here. So thank you, Ljubica. Uh, she does have a Serbian uh, origin, which is a coincidence. So we reached out to, to one of her colleagues, and he actually pointed us to her. Uh, she has both parents are Serbian, but she's not so fluent in Serbian. But regardless, we're doing this talk in, uh, in English. So. Uh, I've had a chance to speak a couple of words in Serbian with her before the call, so it was super fun. Uh, she's good, although modest, uh, so uh, I'm pretty sure she will kick ass um, in this talk uh, as well. So um, one more thing about uh, Ljubica. So uh, she, uh, as I said, is a developer advocate for at uh, Neo4j, uh, where she continues to explore her love of the power of connecting it through graphs. Uh, she's previously worked uh, in data uh, architecture, consultancy, development, and ecology. So all these different uh, kind of skills and areas uh, blended in uh, to uh, what, what Milica does today uh, at uh, Neo4j. And uh, I'm super excited uh, to hear what you have to share uh, so, Milica, sorry for the long introduction. I usually do this. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you to death and your time will come. So the next one and a half hours, at least, uh, are yours. So first part, um, general introduction, second workshop. And just to announce at the end, uh, again, we'll have uh, some live chat we'll let for people to get to know each other. Uh, we'll probably have it just for like 20 minutes so you can maybe meet two or three people um, in a kind of five uh, five minute speed roulette uh, at the end, but without further ado, I apologize. Slightly longer introduction. Uh, welcome, uh, Ljubica, and uh, this is a hands on intro to Neo4j. The floor is yours. I will be dropping in with some questions uh, if I think uh, there, uh, there are some things which people might find um, unclear. I also encourage everybody, everybody who are doing it live uh, to comment uh, in the chat. Um, of the event. Um, both me and Milica will be uh, watching at it. I will be helping it more right and kind of reading out uh, uh, when the time comes. So feel free to ask questions. Ljubica, here you go. Neo4j, uh, hands on. 
Thank you very much, Nicola. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Super excited to be here. We are going to have so much fun. So I have put the link in a couple of times into the chat. So we, for those of you who are joining in for the hands-on element, you will need the sandbox. That's the easiest way to get started. So there will be a link further on, but for those of you who are looking forward, looking ahead, it's uh, neofj.com slash sandbox and you want the blank one. Okay, so let's have a look. So as Nicola talked, uh, spoke earlier, we are going to be looking at a number of things. So we're going to be looking at what is a graph, what's a graph database, and why I think they're so amazing. I am going to introduce some scenarios to help you spot where they're a good fit for graphs. Uh, we're going to look a little bit deeper into what is the anatomy of a property graph database. And I'm going to introduce you to Cypher, which is the Near4j query language. And then we are going to have a go ourselves with writing some queries. And last but not least, to complete your journey. So if you're really excited and you want to know where to progress your graph journey, I'll give you a link to some of the resources we've got available so you can continue. So very quickly, what is a graph? So certainly very, very commonly when you hear graph, people think, aha, Excel, it's a, it's a pie chart. So when we talk about graph in this perspective, we are talking about the area of graph theory, which is a set of discrete objects. And those discrete objects may have relationships. And we're effectively describing how these different discrete entities are connected to each other. And this came originally from a very famous maths puzzle that was posed in a newspaper, which was the Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. So Konigsberg is in uh, was in Prussia, now modern day Russia. So it's known as Kalingrad. So some of you who were following the World Cup will remember some of the matches were played there. And briefly, there were these four land masses. So uh, the so two parts of land and two islands. There were seven bridges that were connecting these land masses together. And this math problem was posed, was it possible to visit all of these land masses using the bridges, but you could only use the bridges once and only once. So very famous Swiss mathematician, Leonard Euler, came across this maths problem. And effectively, he rationalized that the best way to solve this problem was to abstract away from this and try and reduce this down into the most simplest components. So effectively, he took these four land masses and the seven bridges, identified that the land masses were these discrete objects. The bridges would be the relationship connecting these things, and thus graph theory was born. So you may have heard the nodes referred to as vertices in graph theory, and you may have heard the relationship referred to as edges in graph theory. So that is the origin or origins of a graph. And absolutely, anything can be a graph. So for example, the internet has many different ways of how it can be represented as a graph. So as an example, we may think about how we're connected to each other and the fact that, for example, we are connected to each other because we are both at this event, this event being held in a, on a, in a virtual way on the platform. Maybe we're sending emails to each other. Maybe we're sending text messages and so forth and so forth. And th this is an example of how we've got all of these nodes. So those us as, as people of nodes and the relationships can be the different ways that we're communicating to, to each other. Another way that we are representing graphs with an internet will be maybe thinking about the different ways and different things that are connected. So you think about our devices, our mobile phones, our tablets, laptops, internet of things, and they're going to be connected via Wi-Fi or a cable. And then we look at the routers, Wi-Fi routers, switches, hubs, and we start digging further. We've got firewalls, load balancers, all the way down to the big servers, down to the tin, the wire, the things that are connecting. Again, this is all a graph. These are, all have these connections, these independencies, and describing the relationships between them. Another example of something that can be represented as a graph would be a water molecule. So if we think about what a, what a water molecule is, it's an oxygen atom connected to two hydrogen atoms. But very specifically, that it's not just that we have these two elements of varying quantities, it's how specifically they're connected. And it's the fact that you have a two relationships coming out of the oxygen atom 
to the hydrogen atoms that give you specifically a water molecule. So again, we are really interested in those relationships between those entities, and that gives us a water molecule. So many, many things can be represented as a graph. So why do I get so excited about graphs? And I'm an absolute graph geek. I, I'm not ashamed to admit it. So here's an example I really love to use, and it's a bit of a contrived example, but let's think about buying trainers. And in this example, why have we got three people buying this specific set of trainers? So I'm, and I'm sneakily introducing you to the graph model as well. So by the time we get to the anatomy, you'll be like, oh, I know what this looks like. So we have a product in the middle here, which are, which are trainers. So they've got specific trainers, they've got price, that kind of thing. And if we have a look, we have three people. So we've got Jane, Alison and Ian, and they are all connected to these trainers. And the reason they're connected, we've had this bias and have all bought these trainers. And when we look at the date property here, we can see Jane, then Alison, then Ian bought these trainers. So I think there's a story going on here. So I am going to go off. I'm going to bring in some social media that I have and I'm going to explore this further. And the thing with graphs and entities, as soon as you know two things are connected, you put that connection in. So let's say we've done that and let's have a look. So. Jane buys these trainers and she's obviously happy with them. So she puts a post on Twitter and, you know, my I love my trainers. Brilliant. It turns out that Alison follows Jane on Twitter. She reads her tweet, buys those trainers and she's obviously happy with them as well. So she posts an update on Facebook. My trainers are brilliant. So obviously she's very happy about them. And it turns out that Ian is friends with Alison on Facebook, reads that message. He's influenced to buy the same trainers, posts a picture of them on Instagram and so forth. And this is a bit of a silly example. But the point here, we're showing that it's not just the data entities that are important. It's also those connections between them that can give us a really rich story. And, and in this example here, we're seeing how influence is happening through the network through um you know the happiness of this product uh, another example i'm going to bring up which is facebook so or linkedin the other social media stations where you're on there and you go so why is facebook suggesting that i may know this person or i should connect to this person or linkedin will recommend a, a group of people that you may want to add to your network so this is, again, thinking about the graph structures and what's going on in those relationships. And the example of why Facebook is recommending someone you may know or why LinkedIn is suggesting you may want to connect with somebody is because it's having a look at what's the overlap. So let's say, for example, Facebook is recommending that I might want to connect with, I might want to be friends with Bob. Well, let's let's step back a bit. So if it turns out that I'm friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, and Bob is also friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, then you go, well, hang on a minute, there's lots of common connections between me and Bob. And at some point, there is going to be a threshold where we go, the likelihood of me and Bob knowing each other, but, you know, for whatever reason, we've never connected. Well, we can suggest that this is a potential place to connect that link. And we're going to have a look at an example of this in the sandbox where rather than friends of friends, we're going to be looking at co-actors of co-actors. So basically, how can we recommend new co-actors for an actor to work with that they haven't worked with before based on who they have worked with before and who might be a good fit? So uh, basically, we're going to be building a recommendations engine. How cool is that? So we've talked about some fun examples here. And what I want to do now is to have a look at some ways of being able to identify when a graph database might be a good fit for what you're working on. So looking at the first scenario, which is, does our problem involve understanding relationships between entities? So what do I mean by this? So we've got another example and we've moved over from trainers to T-shirts. I'm sure you're all happy to hear. And we've got two customers here and 
what we can see here that these two customers have both bought t-shirts. They're different t-shirts, so they're different sizes, different colors, they've got a different stock keeping unit, so they're completely different. But they both feed into the category of product. So why might we want to understand the relationship between the customer and the category of product that they're buying? So what we can do here is we can build context. So very similar to the idea where we're looking at where you might recommend friends. What if our customer here, Lisa, has also bought a baseball cap, pair of shorts and sunglasses? Maybe she's going on holiday. So we've got a context going on here of a group of four products that may be suggesting something going on. So if we've got Jane and Jane's put into her shopping online shopping basket a T-shirt, a pair of shorts and a baseball cap, we might go, well, actually, there is a big overlap here between what Lisa's buying and what's Jane buying. So before she hits the pay button, maybe we can spring up recommendations for sunglasses based on these common things. So we are effectively looking at the relationships and structures in the graph to be able to build out recommendations. And this is super powerful, especially when you need to do this at real time and you need to have an answer within milliseconds. So these kinds of scenarios you're going to see for recommendations engines. So this is something we've talked about. Fraud detection is another great example. So again, we are going to be wanting to understand the relationships. So for example, if you think about retail banking, you expect a certain structure in a graph. So typically you'd expect low connectivity between a person and other people because maybe you've got people living at the same household so maybe they're going to share the same phone number the same address but you don't expect a huge amount of connectivity so by understanding the relationships between your data points if you start seeing these long connection chains going on then you probably want to go off and analyze that so again understanding those relationships between entities Finding duplicates. So again, another technique that we can use, which is really great. So very similar to the technique that we use for defining recommendations, we can use that to tokenize our graph and figure out, do we have lots of overlapping links? So for example, somebody's misspelled their name in different places, or there's been a merger of multiple companies together, we can start to have a look and see, well, maybe we've got a John Smith, a Jay Smith, a John Ian Smith, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got overlap of names, of date of birth, of address. We can use those structures in the graph and understanding those relationships to be able to go, ah, these are probably duplicates, and you can start cleaning up your data. And data lineage being another key one, being able to understand the journey a piece of data has gone through, what transformations you've applied, how it's been used, and just being able to follow the chain all the way back so that if you need to understand or do some kind of audit, you have the option available to you. So let's look at the next scenario. Does the problem involve a lot of self-referencing to the same type of entity? What do I mean by this? Let's have a look at another example. So here we've got a company and we've got Jane here. And whilst everybody here is an employee, specifically Jane has two direct reports and one indirect report. So we have this information here. So when we think about self-referencing, if we look at a relational database as an example, commonly you would store employee data in some kind of normalized table. And you would probably in this instance have three columns. So you'd have the employee ID as one column. So that would probably be your primary key. You would then maybe you'll have a name in there as well, because this, this is very normalized. And then your third column would be the ID of who manages that employee. So that would be fairly normalized. We don't have any repeating data in there. But if I wanted to find out all of the direct reports and indirect reports for Jane in this setup, and this is quite common, you would have to write a SQL query that keeps referring back through, cycling through the table, trying to flesh out every possible uh, variation to answer that question. Whereas coming back to this idea of graph, and we touch on a little bit this as we go on, because as soon as we know two things are connected in a graph, we put that connection in straight away. So all we need to do in this example here is if I wanted to know 
all of Jane's direct and indirect reports. I start here at this node, so I, I find my spot here, and then I just chase the relationships down. So I just basically say, keep following through all of those relationships that have a managed type and then bring back all of the names of the employee nodes that come back. And that's a much simpler, much straightforward thing to do. Again, because we treat those relationships as first class citizens. So that's how the data is stored and queried. So where might you see this kind of graph scenario? So organizational hierarchies. So we've just had a look at an example of that. Access management. So if you start thinking about the various documents that are being created and who has access to this, what team might have access to this, exceptional reason why an external person might have access, you'll want to be able to look at these and follow them through and make sure that if you need to shut off access to something quickly, you can. Social influencers. So being able to spot patterns, so again, using graph algorithms to spot clusters or groups of people. So is there somebody within your network that's particularly influential? So if you are a company looking to sell a certain product, do you find the influencers and sort of target them with your advertising? And if they're happy with your product, they're then going to distribute that message through their network and friends of friends. So we had a look at that as an example. So again, we're looking at friends of friends based on relationships and again, fitting in that overlap. Scenario three. Does the problem explore relationships of varying or unknown depth? So got very simple supply chain management example here. So we have got three organizations and they all have some kind of relationship with products. So we've got Pencils Are Us. So Pencils Are Us, you'll be surprised to hear, produce pencils. So they buy raw material. So in this case, it's wood and they buy wood from We Sell Wood. They turn that raw material into pencils and then they go on and sell that pencils to a stationery company called Wheel of Stationery. Uh, Wheel of Stationery also buys stationery from other places and they go on and sell that to other companies. So in this example here, Wheel of Stationery sells pens to We Sell Wood. Now, what happens in this example here when we see that we sell wood, which is a family company, decide that they're going to close up, they're going to retire now, and they're going to close up the business. So we can now start to see there's impacts going on here. So pencils are us are no longer going to be able to source their raw material. They're not going to be able to source wood from we sell wood. So what happens there? So do they now need to start figuring out new places to find the wood? That's going to have a knock on impact with them producing pencils which will have a knock-on impact to Wheel of Stationery. So does Wheel of Stationery now have to find another supplier of pencils? And then there is potentially a minor knock-on impact, maybe not so much, that maybe Wheel of Stationery now sells 10 less pencils a month, 10 less pens a month to Wheel Wood. But you can start to get an idea. And this is a very simple supply chain. What happens if we start digging this further? So if we think about pencils or us, they're going to be sourcing graphite, that's probably going to come from an intermediary that does some processing. There will probably be a miner somewhere that's actually mining that material and so forth. So you're going to have potentially lots of varying depths in here. And just being able to understand what happens if there's a disruption there is super powerful and a really great graph fit. So again, we've got some examples. So we talked about supply chain visibility. Bill of materials is another one. So when you go to some of these websites and let's say you're, you're buying a car or a laptop and you know how it gives you those options like, you know, what, what size wheels do you want and what color do you want? And there's always some kind of strange incompatibility going on. So, for example, you can't have the uh, sort of 30 centimeter wheel caps with the 32 centimeter wheels, for example. So there's going to be some rule things going on, but being able to have the links there and make sure you have the right, right flow. And network management is a great example again. So we talked about how the internet could be represented as a graph. So you think about the network you may have uh, within an organization and what's the impact of a server going down? So what happens, what, what are the applications that are being run on that server and the users that are using it? What is that impact? Being able to figure out those impacts and see them quickly. And the last scenario, which I think of as, as the quintessential graph problem, which is, does our problem involve discovering lots of different routes or paths? So I think one of the last conferences I went to back, back in the day, back in the day when we used to go to conferences, 
was based in Edinburgh in Scotland and I went by train and there's two ways you can get up there so you can go up the east coast of England to get up to Scotland or you can go down the west side and that's effectively what I did I on the way up I went via the west coast so I went via rugby crew in Lancaster and on the way back I went down the east coast I went past Newcastle and York and the interesting thing here is when you're thinking about route planning, you may have lots of considerations coming in. So do you want the fastest route? So do you want the shortest distance? Do you want the shortest number of hops? Maybe you have a cost per hop. Maybe there is a cost, a, a monetary cost between different hops. So for example here, yes, there are three hops between London and Edinburgh and here there are only two, but maybe it's cheaper. If, I, if we go per hop, maybe, the, the, the cost on the relationship here is significantly less than this route. So there's, and this is all gonna be based on the relationship between the nodes and being able to put that. So this is a really graphy problem. And again, so we talked about logistics and routing, and this again is important. What if there something happened at Newcastle? So you now have to dynamically reroute the route you're gonna go through. So you'll commonly see this in logistics and routing, infrastructure management. So we touched on this with network management. So again, what happens if the server goes out? Can you reroute things around? Can you mitigate for that problem? What do you need to do to do that? And dependency training, uh, dependency tracing. So again, sort of, it could be networks, it could be in a power station. Again, being able to figure out if you have a single point of failure, do you need to bring in redundancy? So we've looked at some graph scenarios. So let's look at the anatomy of a property graph database, which is what Neo4j is. So starting off roughly with our components, we talked about these earlier. Graph consists of a vertex that we use you know, the convention graph theory, or we call them nodes. And that is our main element, our discrete entity from which the graph is constructed. And it may be connected by an edge or relationship. And that will have a direction and we will have a type for it when we're talking about graph databases. And whilst we can have a lonely node with no relationships coming out of it, we can't have a relationship without any nodes. So a node can exist on its own, but a relationship cannot exist without any nodes. So let's start having a look at a property graph database. So we've got our node, we've got our relationship, and what we can do as well is we can add a label. And what a label allows us to do is to give our node some kind of a grouping or a category. So you can see here, we now have a, a node with a person label, we have a node with a car label. And it says optional, realistically, you are always going to have a label. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we do the hands-on activity as to why. You can have more than one label. So in this example here, we started off with person owns car. And maybe that's what we're doing, generally talking about what somebody has. But if we wanted to, for insurance purposes, understand all of the assets that a person owns, maybe it makes sense to have an asset label and we'd add an asset label to our car, to our TV, to our laptop, our bike and so forth. So you can have more than one and that can be super useful. And you also have properties. So we've seen some of these properties in play as well. And this is a great way to enrich a node or relationship. So you can see here, for example, we've now added more context. So here on the person node, we have a property of name, so Jane. And on our car node, we've got a make and model on there and what they are. And we can add properties as well to relationships. So in this example here, it's not just the case that Jane owns a car, but when did she own it from? So we can get that nice enrichment of data going on. And another thing to point out as well is we don't need to have nulls. So from th for those of you coming from a relational database background, you will know that you may have sparse tables, you may have situations where you have to have nulls in. This is not the case with graph databases. So for example, let's say uh, with the person node, let's say we're also adding a Twitter handle on there. So maybe Jane has a Twitter handle, so we put that on so we can do, you know, sort of Twitter, colon, and whatever the handle is. Uh, let's say Dan is another node. He doesn't have Twitter. So that's fine. We don't, wouldn't put Twitter colon null. We just don't put it on. In fact, you cannot set null values on there. 
So that's the anatomy. So let's have a look at how we query the graph and then we're all going to have a go ourselves. So Cypher is our query language. It's a pattern matching, pattern matching query language made for graphs. It is a declarative language. So what do we mean by declarative? For those of you who have not come across that before, you tend to have two different ways you can use a programming language or a query language, and it's either an imperative language or a declarative language. So imperative means we have to give very specific instructions to the engine as to what it needs to do. So for example, if I asked my husband to make me a cup of coffee, I could give him very specific instructions or maybe get me a cup of coffee. Let's be a bit, I'm going to make it a bit broader. So maybe I tell him specifically, well, you need to go do a 30 minute walk into town and then go to this specific coffee shop and then you're going to order me this coffee and then you're going to bring it back. If I say from a declarative perspective, if I ask my husband, uh, can you bring me a cup of coffee? He may decide that it would be significantly faster if he uses the coffee machine we have downstairs in the kitchen to make me a coffee and bring that up rather than doing an hour's round trip to go and get me one. So Cypher is declarative. You do not have to give specific instructions to Cypher as to what it needs to do to answer your query. It's expressive. So what you will spot is it very much describes the query that you're writing. So we're gonna have an example of that shortly. And it's pattern matching. So it's all about pattern matching. So we talked, for example, about the fraud rings and spotting things like that. So what you can do is rather than when you think about Cypher, you have to give a very specific, you know, find this aggregation, find this table, find this name, find this row, and then do a bit of joining. The beauty with Cypher is if we don't know how many hops something is connected, but we know a rough pattern of what it looks like, or we want to find an example with the fraud ring, what we want to do is we want to find a person node that has a relationship chain of 10 hops out because that's super dodgy. Nobody should have uh, you know, a, a chain of 10 coming off a person node in a retail bank, for example. We can provide that pattern and, and search. And my favorite bit, it's with the ASCII art. It is very, very sort of decorative when you're writing your queries. So we've got some nodes and relationships at a glance. So I don't, uh, we, can, uh, we can figure out how to make this as a handout if this is useful during the session, but very quickly on a page. And maybe everybody can screenshot Ooh, themselves at the moment. Quick screenshot time. Oh, Stanley Serb said he loves Knowles. We're going to have to have a chat. Um, Mian asks, may we send the materials? Yeah, we can make them available. I'm, I can make the slides available. That's not a problem. Uh, are you seeing something I'm, I'm not seeing? I don't see that in the... It's on the stage button. Uh, on the stage. So I would urge everybody to just post on the event, uh, but just to make sure, okay, so everybody already posting on the stage. So let's move all the, the discussion then at, uh, at stage. So just uh, post up there. Oh, sorry, I, I will yeah. even page. It, it's all good. So hopefully everyone's got screenshots of this, marvelous. So I'm gonna quickly rattle through this slide and then we're gonna see this put in practice. So uh, generically, roughly, all nodes in Cypher are represented with round brackets and relationships may look like one of these. So here I've got node, I've got no node label in there, I've got no reference, it's completely blank, but it represents a node. And here the relationship, this is the super lazy, relationship two hyphens. I've got no direction, I've got no relationship type, I've got no properties, nothing. Or maybe I'll add a direction in there. So I, I represent the, the direction of the relationship with an arrow. Or you may see this. So we represent relationships with square brackets. So the square bracket means we may have some information, some specific stuff we want that rep um, relationship to be. So you may see one of these and all of these are relationships. 
Okay, so let's bring this a step forward. We go, well, actually, what I want is I want some kind of a reference, a placeholder that when I run a specific part of my query, the the, the all of the nodes that match my query or all of the relationships that match my query, we're going to put that into that reference. So here we do that by just having a word. So obviously my word consists of one letter and it can be anything. Same idea of the relationship. So here we're now using the square brackets because we want to get something specific about the relationship. So there you go. So we're using the round brackets. That's the node. We're using the square brackets. That's the relationship. And this is how we do the reference. If we go, well, actually, what I really want is I want to filter out my nodes or my relationships based on the specific label or type, then we'll use this convention. And you'll notice that they're exactly the same convention, although we use different styling um, sort of code rules. But here it's colon label name for a node. Here it's colon relationship type for a relationship. So again, we're in the round brackets, so we know this is for a node. We're in the square brackets, we know this is for a relationship. If you go, well, actually, I want to be a bit more specific than that. So as well as having a specific node label or relationship type, I also want to include a specific property. So we do properties, again, same, same way for both the node and the relationship. So we use the curly braces, and we use this key value pair setup for the properties. So here... I've got name Bob for my node. Here I've got role and babe for my relationship. So you can see that the same, exactly the same setup. And if we go, well, actually, I'm going to want to do something with that. So I want to get my information about a person and a specific property. And I want to put that into a reference so I can then do something later. So maybe I want to return some results. Maybe I want to continue my query on something else. Then you see here, we've got the same idea. So we've got our reference. So I'm now using P rather than N. I've got R here, relationship. And notice the reference is always on the left-hand side of the colon. So everything, to, you know, so here, reference, left-hand side of the colon. Colon thing is going to be the label or the type. So you can see the same thing going on here. So let's dive in with some examples very quickly before we do the hands-on bit, which we'll be doing very shortly. So. If I wanted to get some data back from the database, I will use the match keyword. So use match to retrieve nodes. So my first query here, if I wanted to match every single node in the database, then I would do match n. So remember, we need a reference because we want to either return some results or continue a query. So and it's nodes, so we're using round brackets. So match n, return n. That will return everything in the database. If we go, well, actually, what I want to do is I, actually I want to return all of the person nodes in my database. Then we would do n because that's the reference. And now we're putting the label of person. So n colon person. So that's saying filter out all of the nodes that have a person label and then return n. And that will return all of our person nodes. If we go, well, actually, what I really wanted to do was just return all my person nodes that have a name of Tom Hanks. So now we're starting to use the property value here. We have, again, same idea, match n person. So that's going to our reference of n. We're going to use the person label. So we're going to filter all the nodes that don't have a person label. And then we're going to check all of those person nodes and look for those that have a property key of name with the value of Tom Hanks and return n. And here's our Tom Hanks node. So thing to mention, what we looked at previously with the property is an inline property. So this only works if you've got an exact match. And obviously, we will want to do range queries at some point as well. So that query is exactly the same as using this approach, which is match P person. So we know that's going to find all of the person nodes and put a reference of P to it. And then we use the where clause. This is very similar to SQL for those of you who are familiar with it. So when we get into this stop, this stage, we use the dot notation to get at any properties. So here, where p.name is equal to Tom Hanks, return p. That does exactly the same as the previous query. But where the where clause comes in useful is when we want to do range queries. So let's say I want to find all of the nodes that have a movie label with a release property between 1991 and 1999 then we start to see what we can do with the range query. So match M movies, so 
find all the movie nodes, give it a reference of M, where M dot released, so property is greater than 1990, and M dot released is less than 2000, return M, and that will return us all of the movie nodes that fit within that. And that's, again, quite similar to SQL, and obviously will be quite similar to your programming approaches, for those of you who are familiar. So we talked about patterns a lot, so let's start looking at some relationships. It's a bit, a bit more interesting than just looking at nodes. So if I wanted to find all of the movies that Tom Hanks has any kind of association with, well, we know we know this bit, we've seen this before. Notice I haven't put a reference in. So you don't, you can put a reference in, you don't have to put a reference in because I'm not bringing back anything about Tom Hanks, I've not bothered. So here you go, this is, I'm being lazy, so I've just put in two dashes. I've not bothered to worry about relationship or anything like that, but I know this is telling me to look at all of the uh, nodes that are connected to my Tom Hanks node that are of a movie label, an M, and return M dot title. So we are now returning the title property, so this will give us a list. So again, when we start playing, you'll start to see that going on. So that's going to return me a list of titles that Tom Hanks has some kind of association with. If I say, well, actually, what I want is I want all of the Tom Hanks films that he's directed. And more specifically, I want to order them by the newest movie first. So again, we're finding Tom Hanks. We're now specifying a type in the relationship. There's a directed relationship. It's a movie. And I'm going to return the title. I'm returning the release year. And then I'm using order by. So again, similar in SQL, order by M dot released, and like SQL, order by by default orders from ascending order. So by putting in this, it will give us descending order. If I say, actually, what I want to know is I want to find all of the co-actors that Tom Hanks has worked with. And I don't mind if Tom Hanks was the director, if he was the, the screenwriter, the actor, whatever else. I want them all, but I want specifically actors, then I can do this. So you can see now I'm looking for Tom Hanks. I've got my two dashes to get me to movie. I'm now going another relationship out from movie, which is acted in, and I'm going to the person nodes. And here I've just decided to call my reference co-actor. I'm using a descriptive named reference in my thing. And again, return co-actor.name. And you can see, again, you can see visually this is what's going on here. So Oh, you've got a question? Oh, no, sorry. I thought you were going to ask a question, Nicola. No, 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 sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, no, no problem at all. So if you want to create some nodes, so we did, we have other things. Also. This is like the super simple version of the, the cipher. If you want to create a node, it's exactly the same setup that we did for match. So if I want to create a person node called Tom Hanks, I just use the create keywords. And here we have MP person. We don't have to use reference if we're creating and not doing it with it, but we've got our person label. We're adding a property of the name Tom Hanks. If I wanted to create a relationship of type acted in between two existing nodes, and the existing nodes are the person node Tom Hanks and the movie node Apollo 13, then I would first match those two nodes. So I match my Tom Hanks node, I match my movie node, and then using those references of P for person, which represents Tom Hanks, and M for movie, which represents Apollo 13, I then do the acted in. And as we said before, uh, when you're creating, oh, maybe if I haven't, I'll say it now, when you're creating a relationship, you must provide a relationship type and you must provide a relationship direction. When you're querying, you don't have to, but when you're creating, you must. So here we've got a um, selected relationship and this will take the two references of the nodes that we've matched and then create the relationship between the two. If you said, well, actually, I'm pretty certain that the Tom Hanks node doesn't exist, the Apollo 13 node doesn't exist, and the relationship between the two of them doesn't exist because we can't have a relationship existing without two nodes attached to it, then we can create the pattern. So the thing to bear in mind, anything to the right of create or match is a pattern. A node on its own is a pattern. It's a very small pattern, but it's a pattern. A node with a bunch of relationships and nodes attached to it is also a pattern. So here, using this knowledge that everything to the to the right of a creator or a merge or a match is a pattern, 
You could do this if we were pretty certain that this exists. And this would create the entire pattern, the two nodes and the acted in relationship connecting them together. So, right, time for us to have a go. So hopefully you have all got Sandbox spun up. If you haven't, now is your chance to quickly do it. So you're going to go to sandbox.newfj.com or newfj.com slash sandbox. It's all the same. It will get you to the same location. Uh, you will want to sign in and you want to click the one that says a blank sandbox. So that will be near the top. It should be fairly easy to spot and launch the project. So when you do it, give it a few moments and it will look something like this once you are spun up. So let me just make this or, or like this, one of the two. So you will get something that looks like this. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for those of you who haven't yet done the sandbox, and then I'm going to give you a quick tour. So if there's any questions, now would be a golden time. Yeah, so it was quite uh, an intensive presentation, uh, a, a lot of information, uh, a lot of little details. So. Um, I'm hoping that that people were able to to follow uh, at least get the uh, the bigger picture and understanding of how how it works and what it does. Um, in the meantime, I created a, a poll. So if you go to a stage and polls, you can answer the question. Just would like to know how familiar you are with the graphs already. Have you already uh, uh, or worked on it either in college or faculty? Um, or at work, uh, or uh, you played it on your own, or never tried it, just so we know kind of what's the uh, the level of participants, so that we know the pace, how how to take it further. If you um, um, answer uh, optimistically, then be ready for a fast pace down the road. So I see <coughs> most of the people who have answered actually do have. Um, some some experience of either working on it or or actually just just playing around, which is good. But again, we have at least uh, now think, well, at least ten people who haven't kind of played at all uh, with it. So uh, I think we need to kind of balance the the pace just to make sure everybody mm -hmm. can follow. Um, um, I hope you were all able to get your uh, sandbox account. Um, to get mine now, it's asking me where did I go to school. Uh, <laughs> oh dear! Let me just. So this this is really interesting, actually. So there's quite a few people who have worked on it. So I, I I hope I hope I get to chat some of you with the uh, the chat roulette later because I'm intrigued. <laughs> Uh, I, I am as well. I, I didn't expect the answers like this, but it uh, seems like this is a very specific topic which, which kind of uh, got the right people to, to, to show up, at least live. Uh, so, so, so that's cool. And, and I think even some, some colleges are working um, on Neo4j as part of their curriculum, which is, uh, which is super awesome. Mm. Um, so I managed to get my sandbox uh, created. It's installed in J browser. So let's give people uh, just one minute more. So I'm hoping they, they are able to do it uh, at least at the same pace as I am while I'm talking. Uh, so uh, just to maybe take one, one step back and like we talked about a lot of use cases. So definitely a lot of applications, but there's just too many applications for people to actually know anything that, that was just yeah. said. So let's try to, to kind of just uh, use one example from the real world and just try to kind of map it to a graph mm -hmm. database and why, it, why it's a problem for a graph database. So sure. uh, like Google Maps and finding the, the quickest route to your destination. Mm -hmm. So if you translate that uh, to a graph, uh, so let's say there's uh, three streets between you and your destination uh, mm -hmm. point, and you can go either by foot or let's say by car. And if you choose, like there's like 10 different variations routes you can take. So like, how would that be represented by a graph in the background? And like, how would, uh, how would a typical solution for the problem of the quickest route, for example, uh, yeah. in this case, uh, handle this? 
So great one. And, and I'm going to also cheekily stick in another example at the end. Of <laughs> nice, nice one. So if we think about, so let's take the example where we're talking about route planning and we've got different points and paths and that kind of thing. So if we think about what's happening and we've not really covered it in, in the slides, but just very quickly, effectively how near for j is set up under the hood is we call it a graph native database. And what do we mean by this? So basically what we say is we try to represent the graph structure throughout the entire stack. So how the data is written to disk, how it's pulled into memory, how we query it, that kind of thing. And this is quite different to some other approaches that have been done with graphs. So what you find sometimes you get like a graph API and what that graph API does is effectively sitting on top of a relational database. So you're still storing your data in tables, but you have to do some thing to transform that into some kind of graph in your layer. And the, the, the thing with that is that's a bit of a performance issue if you think about the various joins and things and spinning that you have to do. And sometimes you have to completely change the structure of how you store your data. Now, if we come back to a to like a pure graph database, lots of a better description. So as soon as you know two points are connected, you put a connection between them and how that's represented under the hood is effectively linked lists. So what will happen is you will have a, a, a pointer in memory for your node. You'll have a pointer in memory for your other node. You will have in your uh, memory your relationship, and in there it'll have as part of the and all the relationships are fixed size. By the way, it'll have a pointer that says this was the outbound node. This is where the pointer address for the outbound node is. This is the pointer address for the inbound node. Uh, here's another pointer that says where the the type of the relationship lives and so forth. So if effectively, if you're thinking about, well, actually, I'm just trying to chase a path between two nodes, what you're effectively doing is you're chasing pointers between your nodes. So it's a completely, it's effectively a paradigm shift of how you're actually storing that data. And this is something that would have been very expensive to do, say, 15, 20 years ago when memory was very expensive. But now computer memory is commoditized. It's really cheap. It's no hassle at all to go off and spin up a massive memory machine in AWS or pick your cloud. So it's super cheap. So it allows us, it's, it's a relatively efficient approach anyway. And now memory is so cheap, we can have those structures easily. So coming back to this idea of doing the route planning, when you think about some of the shortest path algorithms that are out there, effectively what you can do is you start chasing down a path and maybe the first path you've picked between two points isn't the shortest, but the point is that's your benchmark. And then immediately, as you're starting to pick the different routes that traverse down, as soon as it's longer than the one you're current, you know, you're on, you just don't even bother exploring it. You just trim it off. So immediately, you can start to see how you're chopping all those lengths off. So you can see how, from a route planning perspective, where if your weight is going to be either pure number of hops or your weight is on the relationship, you can easily see, but because you're having those things you're not having to hypothesize all of the different joins between your data because you did that bit when you loaded your data. As soon as you were writing your data to the database, you said, yeah, these two elements, they're connected. So we know we have those physical joins. Whereas if you think about a relational database, well, we don't know about those joins until the time of read. So that means we have to hypothesize a bunch of joins where, so you lose that step. It's, it's kind of flipping on its head. So you can see now from a root planning perspective where this makes sense. So I'm now going to switch over to an example that a colleague of mine, Max Damasi, um, former colleague, uses a lot, and I love it. And he'll so, like just to recap to, to oh, make sorry. sure that, that that we understand. Uh, so basically, you're saying they're uh, implemented as a two two way linked list, right? Each node, yeah, so it much, can go yeah. both ways, right? Uh, well, the relationship, yes. So yes, the relationship okay. will point to which two nodes it's connected to. Okay, so that's two sided. Uh, yeah. Uh, linked list, they're, they're stored in memory. And uh, for example, in this case, for example, route optimization, you would go uh, one route way until the destination, randomly chosen at first, probably, or like pick the first. So depending on the graph algorithm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. different algorithms, but you would yeah. kind of optimize if it's uh, higher, then you drop it. If uh, when you start adding the hops, uh, if it's higher yeah. than the previous one, which is kind of the lowest kind of typical. Uh, yeah. search uh, search problem, but just traversing through different um, routes yeah. on the graph. And like, are you, uh, how, how is that mark that you have already passed through one or is just like 
Um, how, how, do, how do you know that, that you're kind of don't, the problem here, the graphs is usually like the loops, right? Yeah. How do you avoid ending up in an in endless loop? In an endless loop. So specifically with Neo4j and Cypher, as an example, you never cross the same path twice between two nodes. So you may extend the path around, but how do I put this? Um, how, how do I put it? So you could, you could revisit two nodes, but if you had if you had a three node triangle, let's keep this really simple. So let's say we had a three node triangle. So we have nodes A, a B, and C, and A, and a B, A, C, that they're all connected to each other. So if I wanted to say what was the shortest path from A back to A again, it's only going to do that path once. So maybe it'll go twice. So maybe it'll go once A, B, C, and then we'll go on A, C, B, A. But that's it, because those were the two sort of points. It's never going to do that. You're not going to keep going around and around. So it'll stop there. So obviously, as we start expanding it out, yes, you'll have some reoccurring things, but it's never going to re-repeat the same path. If, that, if you see what I mean, like the, the yeah, possible yeah. path. So, cool. so just by virtue of that, it's going to... Cool. Before you jump into the other example, which I'd love to hear, just one question from the, the audience. Davor uh, Pauracha is asking, how close are graph databases and Cypher to ontology and only in terms of purpose? Uh, that is a great question. So I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, sort of ontologies and OWL and RDF and RDFS. So effectively, you've kind of got two groups of graphs. So you've got the label um, property graph, which we're, which is what Neo4j is. And then you've got the resource descriptive framework, which is the RDF one, where a lot of uh, ontologies tend to come and, and come and base. So... What, so typically, people will go off and create ontologies to describe sort of the models of their organization, and they're trying to do some kind of standardization of their data or that kind of thing. Or maybe you're going to use something like RDF because you're serializing that data and you're sending it around the internet, or you're doing some kind of inference thing. So that's generally where it sits. Now, the uh, so I know probably should quickly say we have got a, uh, a plugin called Neo Semantics that does allow you to switch between RDF and Neo4j property graphs and back again. But I think the interesting thing here is what you're trying to do and how you're trying to use it. So the nice thing with Neo4j is it is a transactional database. So you can drive your model and you can describe your model and maybe you're going to use a property graph for that. Maybe you will do your ontology design and, and transform it to that. So there are some links here and I'm not going to go too much because I'm not the expert in this. We, we have a colleague who varies, but the general flavor of this, it's a lot more usable from a property graph. If you know what your, um, what your APIs are going to be, what they're set up, then you'll probably find it more performant, easier to use, easier to see visually with a property graph. If you don't know what your APIs are going to look like, or you don't know how things are connected. So this is a nice thing about, uh, something like an ontology or an owl is you're only ever worried about the subject of um, subject predicate object those sort of triple connections we keep joining them in so you can sort of grow that a little bit where if you have a bit of hiding from a certain part of the graph you can expand that out so to some extent you do have schema on right with nefj where it's not you don't have to de declare your schema at the at the head of time but you still need to think about your data model when you're doing it. You don't want to sort of go crazy. I'm just going to chuck some data in there and it's all going to be amazing. Um, so you still have to do a bit of pre-planning. So I think you get a little bit more flexibility from the ontology side. But uh, but the usability comes more from a property graph database in, um, sort of based on what I've seen. So it is a very interesting question. And I definitely, if there's... If there is interest, if there is a crowd here of people who want to know more about how these things play, I'm sure I can ask my colleague Jesus Barasa very nicely to come along and uh, do that. But if it is of interest, let me know. I can definitely point some materials your way as well so I can get some links sorted. Cool. So, so we are already at one hour, so we right. might need to, to speed things up a yes. bit. <laughs> right, let's do this. Let's, let's get our hands dirty. So very quickly the tour of the sandbox and something i want to say we are going to move at pace don't panic uh, you can come back to this in fact i would recommend you come back to this this will always be available for you the example we're going to do will be available whenever so it's that so the sandbox very quickly is a great way to try out the 
the NFJ database without having to download anything, install anything, it's there. It is temporary though, so you can only have a sandbox up until 10 days maximum, but you can always create a new one afterwards. So you can always come back and create a new one. So don't, don't be putting any data up there that you wouldn't want to lose. But other than that, it's always there. And a very quick tour of the sandbox is if you want to extend it. So by default, you get three days. If you want to extend it up to a maximum of 10, you do have an option here. But the interesting stuff will be the connect via drivers. So we're going to go in using the FJ browser, which is like the, the sort of database tool to have a um, sort of play and visualize the data. But if you want to connect to uh, the database using your IDE, or maybe you're using Python uh, Jupyter Notebooks or something like that, then you have the handy information here. So it'll tell you for so JavaScript, Python, and Java, how to install the associated language driver. And then you have a code snippet here, and you'll notice in the code snippet, it's already pre-populated the, uh, the URL you need to connect to the, the connection string. You've got the, the username, you've got the password, and it gives you an example of a query. So as I'm sure we can, we can, we can remember, we can probably figure out about this query. We're gonna match all of the nodes in the database. We're gonna so count, as the name suggests, it's gonna give us a count of the, uh, the nodes and limit. This is basically a limit again, similar in SQL, what we're cutting it by. So here we're limiting by 10. And you have the same thing for Python and Java. So you have those. If you want to have a play once you've got some data, and as you may have spotted when you started a database, we've got many different examples. And the blank sandbox is the only one that doesn't have any data, all the other than do. So lots of opportunity to play and explore. So you have that. And I'm now going to click on the open button. And that's going to, by default, open up the Neo4j browser. So if you all do that, and I think I'm hoping everybody is in event. So we are going to be using this command, which I'm going to type in now. So it's colon play movies. And this will all make sense once the browser has started. Oh, Nicola has copied it over. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, so this is what you'd be greeted with. Don't worry about the, the yellow bar. That This is effectively a, a latency check the browser does with the database. And so don't, don't panic about the yellow. It's all fine. So what we're going to do, I'll give you a quick tour of the uh, Neo4j browser. So this is like a development aid. It allows us to write some queries, visualize them, play with them, and so forth. So all of our queries are run in this pane here. And you'll notice we've got a play button. And I'm going to go through this button once we've got some data in. OK, so I'm just going to put in my query, play movies, and hit play. And what you'll notice is that this frame will pop up. So this is what we call a browser guide. And this allows us to well, effectively browser guides. You'll see all of the sandboxes have them. And it's a really neat way of being able to describe something in the database. And it allows you to interact with the database, too. So very quickly, you can see here, it's given a description of what this guide does. I can click on these buttons to navigate through. Anything in a gray box like this means it's clickable code. So if I click on this, I don't have to type all of that code. It will send the code up into the query window, which is nice and handy, and so forth. So one thing I would suggest that you all do is you'll notice this little picture of a pin. So what you'll see is as you run queries, the windows jump down. So if I press this pin, it'll make sure that this browser guide frame stays at the very top so that we can click through and follow stuff in. So you've got all the instructions there. And again, you can run this anytime. You can do curl on play movies. If you want to have another go at this tomorrow, next week, next month, you want to show your friends, it's always available. And this will run on the FJ, um, Sandbox here, if you want to use Neo4j desktop, which you can go off and download, it'll run there. It will run absolutely anywhere. OK, so we can click the next pane. We can click on the grey box to send our code up. This is going to create some data. So very quickly, we'll have a look at a couple of these. So we've got the create keyword, so we're creating some data. Here we've got round brackets. That means we're creating a note. We've got some stuff before a colon. 
So that means we've got a reference, the container we're going to store the data. We've got some, a colon and something else. So we've got a label. Our label is movie, so we're creating a movie node. We've got some curly braces, so we're creating some properties. And here we've got a number of properties. So we've got uh, a term called the title, the matrix. We've got a released year. We've got a tagline. So we're creating a movie node, same idea here. We've got another node because we've got the round bracket. So this is a person node. Again, we've got the reference. We've got some properties. We've got a label. And if we look down, we can then see we're creating a load of relationships as well. So we're using the reference that we created previously for our nodes. And we're now connecting those nodes using the references with the relationship. So we've got it here. And one thing I'm going to shout out, so you can see we've got the label, sorry, the relationship type, we've got the direction. And I'm just going to quickly call this one out just in case it's not obvious. So yes, it's in square brackets, but that's because we are putting in an array. So that's an, that's a, a, an array with the square brackets rather than anything else. So you will notice when we're on the query, one of the uh, actors has a role where they play multiple roles. So yeah, so that's just representing an array. So you can have arrays as properties in the database. That's for the case when a single actor played multiple roles in the same movie, not in multiple yes. movies. Yes, just, yes, uh, yes. Clarification. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that's what we've got going on. So we, we create a bunch of data for our database. And then at the very end, we have a query that we run. So we created a load of data, the first part of the query. And now we're going to return something. So what we do, so sometimes we have to tell the engine to remember some of the references, because up until this point, it's, um, it's going to leave it. So what we're saying here is we want to bring down one of the references. So I take, take my word for it that Tom H is a reference to the Tom Hanks node. So with allows us to do that. That's the, the with keyword. So with is basically saying, please remember this reference and bring it down. As is an alias. So again, you, you will have this, I think, in most of the SQL languages. So it just basically, we're changing the, the, the alias name, the, the reference name from Tom H to A. And then we've got match. So we know what match does. So match is going to match A, which we know is our Tom Hanks node, acted in M. And it's around brackets. We know it's, we know it's a node. And we know what the structure of the data is. We know it's, it's always person movie or person to person. So I'll show you quickly how to see that. Uh, directed in D, return AMD. So we know by the structure of the data that this is going to be a person node. We know this is a movie node and we know this is Tom Hanks. So that's a person node. And we're going to return AMD. So that's going to return those three nodes. And that limit keywords turned up again. So that's going to limit our results by 10. So let's do that, and it's going to give us some data. And I'm going to just scroll down a bit. I should probably make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. So this is what's being returned back. So you can also press the arrow button to do that. So what I'm going to suggest is... So just, to, just to make it clear for everybody, you need to cl click on the play yes. uh, button to execute the... Yes, the Press Click on the play button to execute. So before we um, play around with this, if I now click on this little database icon picture, this now gives us information about what's in the database. So we can see we've got 175 nodes, and these are the different labels that we've got in there. Uh, I can see I've got 256 relationships in there, and these are the different relationship types in there. And I can also see what property keys are available. So we get a bit of information about what's in the database there. And what I'm going to give you, so I'm going to give you about two minutes, not a huge amount of time, because we want to dive into some of these queries. So if you expand out, so you've got the two little arrows pointing, uh, pointing out earlier, you can do that. And then just try uh, double clicking on some of the, the nodes. So for example, if I double click on C+, what happens? It pops some nodes out. I can press this little picture of a graph to collapse it again. If I click on Tom Hanks, I can see some information about that node. If I click on a relationship, I get some information there. So I'm going to give it about one or two minutes. Just have a quick click and play so you can see what's happening. I need a bigger screen for this. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's, it's well worth having a play. So do please have a go at this uh, um, later. So this, again, Sandbox is going to be alive for at least three days unless you, you know, if you don't extend it. And, you know, if you forget about it, you can always spin up a new Sandbox and play. So what I'm going to ask you all to do now is if we click on the next the next arrow, so we'll go on this page, fine. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give you about... Sorry, three... where, where did you click to get there? Because people were probably on their screens. Now. No, no, not at all. So if you've still got this big, the double arrows, if you click on this little picture, it's the same arrows, but whereas before they're pointing outwards, click on the arrows that are now pointing inwards. And that will shrink it back down. And if we scroll up, we'll, we'll come back to our pinned, pinned mm -hmm. guide. So you can see now that this was page three out of, um, so we were on page two out of eight. So if we just move on to the next one, which is three out of eight, so you can either click here or click here. It'll look like this. So I'm going to give you about three minutes. And what I would like you all to do is look through each of the question, uh, each of the things here and try not to look at the top thing, but try and figure out what's going on. So I'm going to give you two, three minutes. Just have a look at each one and then try running it and see what happens. So again, you know you can run it by clicking the code block, which will send it up to the top and then press the play button. So give me about two, three minutes and then I'll quickly go through some of those queries. You can take a look at the question in the chat and oh, I can definitely do that. later on. Absolutely. So got a question could you have a quick run through after the play movies i had some trouble with my internet yes sure so i'm just trying to think pour them through yeah so um and Loie, could you tell me a little bit more what you want to run through of and we can sort it out so worst case scenario i can point you to something so if you can just give you a little bit more of what you're after is it like the whole thing from play movies or a section so i can make recap so basically after play movies you will get this like a tutorial with a few steps uh, that you can follow to to execute and play around with different codes so basically play movie starts that tutorial if uh, uh, returns the movies but does play movies start the tutorial because that's when when it shows they would say sorry when uh, the... does does play movies start the tutorial or tutorial yes, start it, start, it starts the tutorial so play Yes. Play movies will start. So, so you play it, you get a chunk of code which creates all the other yeah. uh, all these yeah. entities. You can click on it. When you click on the gray um, uh, area, it will put it up in the kind of code execution block, which is here. And then you can kind of take a look at it, what's been created, yeah. a bunch of kind of nodes and relationships about actors and movies. And when you click uh, the play button, uh, that's the top uh, right in yeah. the this one here. It will execute the code. Once you execute it, uh, it will create create it and show you a graph below which you can yeah. play around. That's this thing. You can click around and play around, see what's there. And after that, you can go to the next um, uh, to the next step yeah. in the tutorial. Which three, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. doing the, the so that's fine. Uh, executing a couple of uh, searches uh, to go through through the graph. So this is what we have covered so far. So how that kind of recaps it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. So yeah. let's have a quick look through. So hopefully you've all had a chance to play this. And some of you may be wondering, well, hang on a minute. There's no, we're not got a label here. We've got no colon label here or here. What's going on? So very quickly, I'm going to talk about what happens. And this is very good from a speed and performance type of thing. And that is, you can just specify this. And what will happen here is because we've not specified the label, so in this example here with Tom, the database is going to pull every single node in the database. And then it's going to filter, it's going to check every single database to see whether it's got a name property. And if it does, does that name property have, you know, value of Tom Hanks? That's what's going to happen. Now, when we specify a label, so let's look at this example here. I mean, obviously, we don't have a Tom Hanks in there. But when we specify a label in this example column person, what we're telling the database is only retrieve the person node. So here, this is a tiny database, so it doesn't matter if we've not specified the label. 
If you've got millions or billions of nodes, what you don't want to do is have to retrieve all of those billions of nodes and then check every single one for a property. If you know, for example, what you want is a person node, and actually you've got 2,000 nodes within your billion graph database that have a person node, then all it's going to do is just bring up those specific 2,000 nodes and then continue the query. So whilst you don't have to, you will probably find you always will because it is just so much faster. Mm -hmm. so that's why you don't have that. So let's move on to the next one. So again. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, Milan asked uh, how can he upload um, his own data set from a CSV? I assume just as we use kind of sandbox project, he should create a new project and just upload yeah. data there, right? Yes, so great question. So again, let me I'll take a, a note. I will put a link up. So we have a very, we've got a number of ways. So you can use the drivers to bring your data up, but the simple way, because let's face it, we will start with CSVs. You have a couple of options. So you have got uh, load CSV. So I will, uh, I'll make sure after the session that I get a link up to load CSV so you can have a play. So you can do that. So one thing to bear in mind with the sandbox, you can load it, but you won't be able to load the CSV from your local drive for obvious reasons. So you either need to put it on somewhere like GitHub and or whatever else, or you can do an export from uh, Google Docs. If you've got Google Sheets, you can actually get your CSV data around that. So I, I can put a couple of links in for that. So just bear in mind that you don't want to put anything publicly that you wouldn't want to, the world to see in one of those sources. So there is a way to encrypt it where you can use AWS S3 and secrets. That's a bit of a convoluted route. But as long as you don't have anything sensitive with regards to CSV, then I tend to just chuck it up into GitHub and then just pull it from there. So let me put a link in that after we finish. Cool. But absolutely, yes, you can just spin up a blank sandbox and have a play. And we also have the graph algorithms on there as well. So if you want to do some fancy stuff, you can. So let's move on to the next one. So let's have a quick peek at this. So we're not going to run these because hopefully, hopefully you should be comfortable with this because we kind of covered this with the Cypher exploration earlier. We are running out of time. So please come back to this later when you've got a bit more time and, and re-explore the sandbox. Hopefully this should all be familiar. And the only thing that's probably a bit different, so I'm just going to quickly explain this one here, is you'll notice, let me just pop this up, is we have this type uh, type function here. So very quickly, what's going on here? So we know we're finding all of the person nodes. We are pulling the relationships and we're using a reference called related to. So we've got square brackets, we know it's a relationship and we want a reference there. There's no type or anything in there. And go to and we want it to all the things that are connected to the movie with the title Cloud Atlas. And this is basically saying we want to bring back all of the people that have a connection to Cloud Atlas. And what type does is it tells us what the relationship type is. And you'll notice we're also putting the related to as something to return as well. So what will happen is you will see it is you'll get like a JSON-esque type object that comes back. So you can see here we've got the person uh, Lana Wachowski as the name. We've got the relationship she's directed. So she directed Cloud Atlas. And you can see this like JSON-esque object. And you know how he talks about the internals of how Neo4j works? So here we've got, we've got the internal identifier for the relationship. We've got the internal identifier for the node that has the outbound part of the relationship. Here's the internal identifier for the node of the inbound part of the relationship. And we've got the, the type. And here you can see we've got no properties on that relationship. So there you go. So that's that little thing. So that gives you all of the information about that specific relationship between those two nodes. So that's just in case for those of you who are going through that or watching this video and going, hey, what's that function? You know, so you're not going in there cold. So what we're going to do, so we're, we're not going to quite touch on the recommendation part, but we are going to spend some time on the Kevin Bacon. So you'll notice there's one more at the end where you have a go at finding the co-actors. So we'll leave that. But let's spend a bit of time on this. I'm going to quickly talk through what's going on. And then I'm going to give you all a bit of time to play with this. So 
Uh, another great graph example is finding a Kevin Bacon number. So for those of you who have not come across it before, there was this bit of a running joke a few years ago about how Kevin Bacon was pretty much in every single movie. And at one point, you could Google uh, an actor's Kevin Bacon number and Google would come back and tell you what it was. And usually it came back as, as two. Like you, you find that like, it's really random, like, actor you, you dig about an imdb and they were like sort of like feature and they'd like have a kevin bacon number of two and if you found one that was three you were like patting yourself on the back but you managed to find somebody that's three hops away so that's where it all came from for those of you who've not come across it before and so let's we talked about this we kept keep talking about these one hop out and the real power of a graph is we can go more than one one hop out and this is where that you know the unknown depths and, and being able to explore what's going on so let's have a quick look what's going on here. So we are matching Kevin Bacon node. Uh, and then here is where it gets interesting. So we've got a square bracket. So we know we're referring to the relationship. And what this basically says, star says unlimited number of hops. And then what we're saying, well, actually, we're providing a range. And our range here is we want to know all of the nodes that are from one up to four hops out from Kevin Bacon. So that's effectively what's happening. So the star saying as many traversals, and then we're reining it in with a, with a uh, range. And then return distinct Hollywood. So Hollywood could be anything, because this is up to four hops out. Because remember, one hop out from Kevin Bacon is probably going to be a movie. Two hops out is probably going to be a person, through, and so forth. So it could be either person or movie node that's coming back. And we're just calling it Hollywood. Distinct, because I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, is you may have uh, some recurring paths. So you may have a situation where you've got Kevin Bacon, movie, person, back to Kevin Bacon, or movie, person, or you, you, you get the idea. So we're putting the distinct in. So one thing I'm going to say before you run this, because you probably want to have a play and maybe change Kevin Bacon to somebody else or, or that kind of thing. A word of warning. Do not remove, when you've got a query like this and there's no direction, do not remove the one to four and go, well, I want to find out every single different path between Kevin Bacon and every other hop. So we touched on this a little bit earlier. Yes, we've only got 175 nodes. Yes, we've only got something like 250 relationships. However, if you think about every single conceivable possible different way that Kevin Bacon could be connected to every other node to graph, we're probably talking about millions of different paths. Because Cypher will let you do that. Cypher will, you know what you're doing, so I'll, I'll let you do that. So don't do that because it'll, it, it'll, not only will it take a very long time, but it will just eat up all of the memory because you think there's millions. Like These, these are small sandboxes with, with small amounts of memory. So do not remove the one to four. You, you, you only do this under specific time. So I've given the advance warning there with the yellow triangle and the flashing exclamation mark. So that's one. So yeah, don't do that. Otherwise, the Neo4j browser will break down. Otherwise, your, 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 to... your, your, your sandbox <laughs> might not live to tell the tale. But don't worry, everybody else's sandbox will be fine. It's just yours that will be broken. So the other one is to, 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 to go, well, then I might hear some of you go, but hang on a minute. You just told us not to do this. And the very next query has got a star. What's going on? Right. Let's talk about quickly what's going on here. So we're using the shortest path. So very quickly, you'll see this notation of P equals. So ignore the shortest path bit for a second. So what we can do is before we talked about patterns where we're specifying with a reference, either the node bit or the relationship bit, what we can do is say, well, actually, I want the entire path and I want to keep the entire path in a reference so I can do stuff with that. And that's and this is the notation that we use. So P equals so this, so all of the, the the path that fits here will come back into the P reference. And shortest path, as the name suggests, is going to find us the shortest path between the two nodes specified. So in this example here, it's Kevin Bacon and to Meg Ryan. And what happens with shortest path? Roughly, again, the implementation may vary, but it'll find one path between those two nodes. Anything that's longer than that path, it's never going to crash and um, sort of go through. And as soon as it finds a shorter path, it's going to forget about the previous path and now stick to the shortest one. So that's why that star's OK, because we're getting rid of stuff that's longer. So those are two queries. So I know we're a little bit over time, so I'm going to wrap it up in five minutes. I'm going to give you two minutes 
to have a quick play with those queries. And if you want to quickly swap out Kevin Bacon for someone else, what you can do is if you click on the if you click on the little database icon here and click on the person node, it will bring back randomly 25 nodes that meet there. So you can click on the table, for example, here. And oh, that's the wrong one. So I've got some existing data now. I forgot to clear out. But anyway, you get the example here, for example, um, Lily Wachowski or Keith Sutherland. So if you want to have a quick go at that, you can. So I'm going to give you two minutes to have a quick play with those two queries because they are fun. And then we'll wrap up. And don't forget, this sandbox is always available. Play Movies is always available. You can come back and have a play at your leisure. Cool. Thanks. Off topic question. So what are you using what are you using here for visualization of the charts? Is it D3 or something else? I so for browser, I don't know. I, I don't I don't I don't think it's D3. I don't know. I, I would have to go off and ask our product team. <laughs> but there are a bunch of visualizations also yeah. available that work with Neo for J2. Uh, cool. So while people are uh, trying this out, uh, I'm really sorry we won't be trying the recommendation uh, example since that's the the most fun one. Well, so here's an offer: if if people can hang around after the the speed chat, because I think it's like an extra five ten minutes. So if it works, I'm happy to hang around afterwards. So how about we do it right away and people do execute this part and the next part after the, the networking. I think that will be, that will be better. So just we have a discussion yep. um, and then people can play around even longer uh, for as long as they want in the night uh, playing with Neo4j. So how about you, you quickly run through yep. the recommendation as well and, and then we wrap it up. Yep, that sounds good. So let's do it very quickly. So. I'm going to quickly talk through these because I think it might be a little bit like, whoa, what's going on? And then once we've spoken through it, hopefully it will, it will make sense. So at what's happening here? So we've got two things. So the first thing we're saying is, as we alluded to earlier, is how do we find co-actors, new co-actors, and this example here for Tom Hanks to work with that he hasn't worked with before. And maybe the best way to find the best co-actors for him to work with that they're all going to get on with will be based on the co-actors that the co-actors he has worked with have worked with. So that's what's going on here. So let's have a look at what's going on. So we have got Match uh, Tom Hanks. Great. So he's acted in this and we know that's a movie because that's the pattern of our data. And these co-actors also act in the same movies as Tom Hanks. And we're calling them co-actors. Great. Now, the next part is we're find, taking those co-actors and we're finding the movies that they've acted in and their co-actors. So we've now got the co-co-actors. So two hops, co actors, two hops away from Tom Hanks. Now, we have to do some filtering in here. We have to put in some rules because what we don't want to do is find co-actors that Tom Hanks has already acted with. So we may inadvertently which makes sense, loop round. So the first bit, where not, so not where not, not bit says is where this pattern doesn't happen. And here we're saying where Tom Hanks has already acted in a movie with those Coco actors. And the other thing that might happen is we may inadvertently bring back Tom Hanks as one of the Coco actors. And I don't think we want to recommend Tom Hanks to himself. So that's it. And the notation we use for not equal to is the greater than less than sort of diamond, where Tom is not equal to co actors. And then we're going to return the Coco actors' names and we're using the as, so we're re-aliasing the name back again. So as recommended, count start, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, as strength ordered by strength descending. So what happens when we do the return or with, which is the equivalent of return, but we want to do more of a query, is you're gonna have some kind of aggregation going on. And if we have a look at what's going on here, the aggregation is going to be the Coco actors. And this kind of makes sense because if you think about it, if we start looking at the actors, you know, two hops out, it's quite likely, quite likely that the co-actors that have worked with Tom Hanks, like whilst they've only worked once with one person, there might be multiple different people that have also worked with them. So in this example, when we do count star, it's counting up how often that Coco actor's name has turned up being connected to other people. And what we're saying here is we're saying, well, the more times that person name pops up, the stronger that recommendation is, the more likely we're going to recommend that because that person's worked with all of the co-actors that Tom Hanks has worked with. And then same idea with the order by, we're ordering by strength. And again, 
by default, all the buyer is ascending order. So this will tell us to order it by descending order. So basically the person who's got the highest count. So that's what's going on in that query. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, and I think this is a great example to showcase how like this is just the tool and the actual kind of quality of the algorithm depends on like wh what is your decision making, how you design, what are the things that go into consideration we're actually deciding what the recommendation should be based on. Like there are different mm -hmm. algorithms, but like in the end, the quality will depend on kind of the developers mm -hmm. or product manager's decision on like how to, uh, what to prioritize and choose. Mm -hmm. Well, the really fun thing here is actually, this is probably a, a really relevant one for something like you think about Facebook and again, the common friends, you could easily see how you've got your Coco friends and you're grouping them together. It's like, well, if I've, you know, if we've got 200 common connections, there's probably a really good chance that we know each other, we've bumped into each other at some point. So it's a uh, great fun. So I know there's a question Florian's just asked. I'll come back to your question in a second. Let me just do this Tom Cruise one and then we'll pick up the questions quickly. Mm -hmm. So the uh, next one is, so, okay, right. So we've identified who the, the strong Coco actor is and let's just assume the, the, the Coco actor that's come out on top is Tom Cruise. So now what we need to do is we need to find somebody who's going to introduce, introduce Tom Hanks to Tom Cruise. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So what we're doing is we are getting Tom Hanks, getting him, and we are going to movie acted in and going to co-actors. So we're getting a group of co-actors that have worked with Tom Hanks. We are doing the same thing with Tom Cruise. So again, we're finding all of the co-actors that we found that were matched to Tom Hanks. We're then taking them as the start point to our next part of our query and finding uh, all of the, um, finding them that then map to Tom Cruise based on an actor, um, based on a movie that they've acted together with Tom Cruise. And then we're going to return Tom, which is Tom Hanks, the, the movie that, that, that he starred in with that co-actor. Uh, we're returning Tom Cruise in a movie that that co-actor worked with uh, worked with Tom Cruise and bring them back. So this is going to give us a list of names of co-actors that have worked with both Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise and the movies that they were both acting in, which is pretty cool. I love and, and the thing is, is it's it's one of these things where for me, and this is why I get so excited, it's like, can you imagine trying to do that with the SQL database, like relational database? No. So my question to you, so everybody can kind of visualize this, visualize this and kind of think of how this would work in, let's say, in practice, in production. So like, do we make copies of the data of some of the data that we have in our relationship database uh, and then kind of duplicate parts of it and then add additional layers just in the um, uh, Neo4j? Um, database or we kind of should we use exclusively Neo4j and it's recommended to use it because as a as and the only mm -hmm. database in your projects is it just for problem specific solutions and like how to best organize that in, in production mm -hmm. environment uh, that's a terrific question and I think the best and it's very much an it depends question and I'm a great believer of um, polyglot databases picking the right picking the right database for the job, which I think beautifully dovetails into my example I was going to mention earlier, where you have, like, so, so my colleague, Max Marzi, he would have this picture of Hollywood actors, like the height chart, and you have, like, really tall ones, you know, all the way down to the not so tall ones. And it's a great example of what's, a, you know, what's a terrible fit for a graph database. If we wanted to work out their average heights, if I wanted to find out the average heights of all of those actors, that's a terrible, you could do it in the graph database, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't jump to it and go, right, that's the first choice I'm going to do. Or if you wanted to work out their average salaries. And if you think back to what's going on, so all of those actors would have a property on there of height and salary. So for us to figure out what the average height was, we'd have to pull all of the actors into memory. We'd then have to pull out their property of height and then do an average of all of that. And you think about the different times of having to pull different parts of the memory to get the information back. Whereas in a relational database, it's in a table. And the relational database excels at basically picking a column and running straight down and doing something with it. So that's, you know, not great use. And it's okay if you've got a smallish amount of data. If you're talking about millions and billions of nodes, I mean, like, you're going to probably use another tool for that. If we wanted to know how those actors were connected to each other, who was friends of friends, what movies were they in, can we try to do some kind of generalization based on the types of movies they 
acting and whether somebody's going to like that certain genre, that's a fantastic fit for graph database because we really care about how they're all connected to each other. So, I, sorry, let's take a specific example of uh, IMDb. So, yeah. like, how would you architect that? So, like, would it be just a Neo4j or you, would you use, like, a relational database for, like, the basic information and then copy the relations uh, in Neo4j, the tool yeah. <laughs> when needed? So, so for example, yeah. this is the case where it has definitely great uses, mm -hmm. but also a relational database as well has its own advantages yeah. in, 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 for certain stuff. So the, the, the IMDB is a really interesting one because to some extent that's a content management system. So absolutely, I would see you would use a graph database for all of the actors, what film did they act in? You then connect the film to a genre. You would then connect something along that, that kind of thing. You, you could probably do the ranking data and the review scores in a graph database too. Maybe that's the one you pick to put in the relational one, depending on the situation. But you think about now in IMDb, you've got images in there. So maybe you're now going to use some kind of store, like a content store, Bob store, to then put the thing. So you'd have like the URI for the, that, that movie poster in, in your graph database, but then you then go to a content, you know, to some kind of blob store to then pull up that reference. You can easily see lots of different things going in there. And I kind of digress a bit, but if we think about, well, what would you do? It really depends on the organization. So I'm gonna pick a really boring example, which is master data management. So that's all about how do you look after your key elements? So if, for example, you're a bank, your master data is going to be things like your customer. So that, you know, you want to have a golden source. It may make sense for you to go, well, actually, I want to have all of my customer data in a graph database. And then I point, you know, and then all of my systems go there because that keeps all the connected stuff. You might go, well, actually, what makes sense is you know, I've got really old systems and I don't want to move that because they just work fine and there's loads of data and I do lots of aggregations and calculations and things. But what I can do is bring the reference of customer up into my graph database so that all of my different systems that mention same customer, I know that they're all connected in the graph database. And then I just go to the main database for all of that information. You might go, well, actually, I'm going to go for a hybrid method. So all of the key information about my customer. So their name, their address, date of birth, account numbers, whatever, that I keep in the graph database. But all the other stuff like historical addresses and any other details and transactions, well, that I keep, I keep that in the source database. So it is very much an it depends question. Uh, cool. So uh, final question, if you have any books to recommend, uh, you can type that in or say it uh, here. So here are some resources, that's awesome. So we will be sharing the presentation, if that's okay, which would say yes, uh, with the uh, attendees. Uh, and it will be available on, on Constantine uh, uh, as well um, uh, soon uh, for those who, who, who register. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's a lot of more questions and topics we could cover and we could dive in. Um, deeper in a, a, a lot of these points and, and discuss different stuff in our lens with different stuff and how to use it in production, etc. Um, but we cannot do that in uh, an hour and a half. Uh, how much we uh, can uh, plan to, to con uh, condense uh, all this stuff uh, into. Uh, we did go uh, slightly over it, so we'll shorten the time for the networking. So there will be only 15 minutes of um, networking so you will i think it's six minutes per session so it's like three minutes to get to know other people so so please stay in and meet other delegates as well um i want to thank you uh Jubica, for um sharing all this and preparing this presentation um i really enjoyed it to uh, find it informative um we'll we'll share the, the average of viewing sessions so most of our uh, talks have more than an hour uh, of viewing time uh, for uh, so that's uh, average viewing time so that's kind of amazing and I'm pretty sure a lot of people have stick to the end uh, so thank you very much for for doing this for sharing sharing this we'll be kind of sending um, everyone the, the recording uh, of the 
uh, video uh, once it's uh, it's live as well as the presentation. Um, thank you all for um, participating, and we see you uh, next week on the next Constantine meetup. Uh, you would say you can feel free always to suggest people who you know are great speakers and that our community can benefit from. We're always looking for for new people. We want to schedule it out by the end of the year so that we have uh, a great session and a great speaker such as yourself every week. Uh, we'll probably have a little vacation in the summer, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll be back in September for sure. Uh, thank you uh, all for joining. Um, a lot of great people, a lot of great comments, a lot of great questions. Once again, thank you for all. Uh, thanks to all the No Limit Hub um, uh, team members who have put this together and make it happen. Um, and you can also go and follow No Limit Hub um, on different social media. We'll be posting a lot of stuff. We also have a Kikas SaaS platform where we also host uh, talks about uh, SaaS businesses, basically more topics about entrepreneurship and uh, growth, marketing, sales, this type of topics. So Constantin is product development and, and technical stuff. Uh, and as you can see in, in both uh, of these uh, projects, No Limit Hub, uh, brings really high-class uh, experts to talk about uh, sp very specific topics.